Can everybody hear me? You sure? In the back? Good. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Inna alhamdulillah Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Brothers, sisters, friends I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace and blessings of God be upon every single one of you My name is Hamza, I'm from the UK And I'm going to be talking about the gifts of God Now The way I want to start today's discussion, and it's going to be a discussion, it's going to be a conversation, I don't like giving lectures, I like to ask questions and start to have a conversation with everybody so we get people to think. The way I want to start this discussion is basically talking about consciousness, because it's an interesting topic and it's something that I'm actually trying to specialize in, in my postgraduate, postgraduate studies at university. And consciousness is very, very fascinating. It's fascinating for me, personally, because it was quite troubling for me when I was around 11 years old. When I was 11 years old, or 12, around that age, I used to like to have hot baths, and I used to put the tap on and sit in the bath and feel really depressed and want to cry. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to cry was because I felt absolutely lonely. It was this kind of psycho-dynamic thing going on. I was really depressed. I was like, oh my God. So why is a 12-year-old crying in the bath, right? It had nothing to do with love, it was to do with the fact that I felt that I was the only conscious being. I know that sounds really weird, but that was the case, okay? So I felt I am the only one aware of my own conscious awareness. And that realization was really lonely because I wasn't aware of other people's conscious awareness and people that I loved and my friends and my family. It was just me alone in the bar. Now you're probably thinking, Hans is weird. <laughs> you're right. But the point is, that was my experience. And that was a form of solipsism, right? The form of, like, I am the only conscious being, the only conscious mind. Everyone knows is just a zombie, right? And that affected me in a very profound way. It's one of those psychodynamic moments in your life which, you know, you basically unfortunately adopt as a filter to understand the rest of your life. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to solve that problem. Anyway, point is, it was troubling for me, okay? So I'm over it now, as you can tell, maybe not. But the point is, I'm over it. But it was important to me because I started to think about consciousness. How is it that I am the only one aware of my own awareness and I cannot experience other people's individual subjectivity and conscious awareness? That reality itself just made me feel very, very lonely for some reason, right? I haven't solved the problem, but the point is that was the kind of emotional driving force for me to think about consciousness. So, consciousness for me, I think, is very important. And there's two elements that I want to discuss. One of them is the fact that it leads to worshipping God, which I'm going to discuss. And the other fact is that it leads to, hopefully, Understanding that there is a divine reality. So let's start with the second one. Many of you are eating muffins right now. That's a blueberry muffin, I believe, correct? Good. Well, and there's a chocolate chip cookie right there. So this young man, what's your name? Mohammed. He was having a chocolate chip cookie and he was having a blueberry muffin. So there is an experience that he was having, correct? Is that true? So he had an inner subjective conscious experience of having a chocolate chip cookie and a blueberry muffin. Am I right? Good. So Muhammad had an inner subjective conscious state. Correct? An inner subjective conscious experience. Now many of you are having an inner subjective conscious experience right now. You are observing me, listening to me, and you're having an experience. It's internal, it's subjective, it's yours, but you are undergoing an inner subjective conscious experience. Someone was having some juice or some coffee, so you're having an inner subjective conscious experience of having some juice and having some coffee and nibbling on some cookies, right? So here's my question. Do we know what it's like for Muhammad 
to have a blueberry muffin? No. Why? Who said yes? Why? Do we? Yeah, but you're not Muhammad. <laughs> That's the point. Do we know what it's like for Muhammad to have a blueberry muffin? That's the question. If I were to map out all of the neurochemistry in his brain, would that lead to knowledge of what it's like for Muhammad to have a blueberry muffin? Give me the answer. No. If you want to raise your hand, you have to come closer. Because I won't be able to hear you, that's why. But you could raise your hand though. But just come closer because I won't be able to hear you. So, do we know? No. But why? Why is that the case? Why is it the case that if we were to understand all of his neurochemistry and map out all the neurochemical all the neurochemicals firing, for example, why would that not lead to knowledge of what it's like for Muhammad to have a blueberry muffin? Yes? Uh, what the speaker said yesterday was uh, doing something and knowing something are two different, very, two very different things. Yeah, it doesn't really relate to this, but he's right. Yeah. Yes? Well, it is his personal experience, but the question here is, we're, we're unraveling something called an epistemic gap. So in philosophy, epistemic relates to knowledge. There is a knowledge gap. If we were to know everything about his brain, it would not lead to knowledge about what it's like for him to have an inner subjective conscious experience. Okay? This is called an epistemic gap in the philosophy of the mind. Okay, and this is a big problem in consciousness. It's one of the key problems of consciousness. Other things are already solved, like cognition and thinking and stuff like that. But when it comes to things like subjectivity or phenomenal consciousness, as they say in the philosophy of the mind, or in neuroscience, they say qualia, right? The inner subjective stuff. There is a gap. There's an epistemic gap. There's a knowledge gap. So if we were to know everything about his brain, it would still not lead to knowledge about his inner subjective conscious experience, right? Now you may argue, but he can describe it. He could use words like tasty and sweet and whatever else you experienced, right? But those are just words, and words are vehicles to meaning, and meaning is the kind of inner subjective stuff that's happening. So, he may say sweet, but sweet for him may be different for me, right? And what level of sweet and what kind of sweetness, right? So it doesn't get us anywhere if you just rely on language. So the point here is there's an epistemic gap. So this is one part of the problem of consciousness. There is another part which relates to the first part, which is, well, how does an inner subjective conscious state arise from seemingly non-conscious physical processes? That's another question. So that's not an epistemic question, it's what you call a ontological question. A question about existence and the nature of something. So, Muhammad, we have a problem, right? We all have this problem because we all have inner subjective conscious experiences and we know those inner subjective conscious experiences arise from seemingly non-conscious Physical processes. These two questions are unanswered in the philosophy of the mind and in neuroscience. No answer. Well, no adequate answer for sure, yeah? Now, my job today is not to give you the kind of nuances in philosophy and neuroscience concerning this. I'm not going to talk about reductive materialism or eliminative materialism or emergent materialism or panpsychism or all these approaches to the philosophy of the mind. I'm not going to talk about how some neurobiological studies try to address the problem of qualia. That's not my job today. That's academic stuff. Forget that. My job today is to plant seeds in your heart and mind so you could investigate further yourself. For yourself. So, we have this problem. And these two questions that we just spoke about, the epistemic question and the ontological question, this is called the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness. So, there is an issue here. What it means to be human 
is to be conscious. And a key part of consciousness, which is the first person fact of having, having an inner subjective conscious experience, cannot intuitively at least be explained by any tools we have at our disposal. Right? Because of those two main questions. Which is, what is it like for someone to have an inner subjective conscious experience? And why does that inner subjective conscious experience arise from seemingly non-conscious, cold, physical processes? And that's why we need to change our metaphysics. We need to change the lenses we put on our eyes to see the world. Because if you have a very naturalistic, physicalistic understanding of the world, that everything can be reduced to physical processes, then you're going to have these questions that you can't answer. Because the things that make you human, such as your conscious experience, your inner, subject, your inner subjectivity, that either has to be ignored, put to the sidelines, dismissed, called an illusion, or we just have to like, basically uh, move on without answering the question in the first place. right? Now before I get into that, I want to give you a thought experiment that summarizes what I've just, spoke, what I've just spoken about. Now, this thought experiment was developed by Frank Jackson, okay? This is called the Mary Argument. Now, what's very interesting is Frank himself, Mr. Jackson rather, he disagreed with the kind of intuitive conclusions of his thought experiment. But notwithstanding that, it's still a very good thought experiment to think about. So, the Mary Argument is as follows. So, there's a lady called Mary and she's in this room. And this room is all black and white and grey, right? And her television is black and white and grey. Everything she experiences is black, white and grey. That's her room, right? She's never seen colour before. All she's seen is black, white and grey. With me so far? So this room is black, white and grey, okay? And there's something special about Mary. Mary is a super scientist. She's a super scientist. She knows all of the physical facts concerning vision and concerning color. So you have this scientist, Mary. She's been living in this room that's black, white, and gray. She's never experienced color before. Her television is black, white, and gray. But she's a super scientist. She knows all the physical facts concerning vision and concerning color. With me so far? Good. So what happens one day is she's allowed to open the door. And when she opens the door, she sees a red rose. What's her reaction? What do you think her reaction is intuitively? Hands, anyone? Yes. She gets very excited. That would be an intuitive response, right? Yeah. One would argue that she doesn't go out of the room and she looks at a red rose for the first time and she says, Ah, I knew it. Right? Does she do that? No. She, most likely she's going to be, Oh my God. That's red? That's really red? Right? So what this shows, intuitively at least, it shows that knowing all of the physical facts do not exhaust all of the facts. Therefore, all the facts are not just physical facts. There is something else other than the physical that exists. Because she's, the wonder, she's a wonderful scientist. She knows all the physical facts concerning vision and color, but yet that knowledge did not give her the understanding of what it's like to see a red rose. That inner subjective conscious experience was something new. And that's why there's, there's massive arguments in the philosophical literature about Mary's argument. What, does she learn something new? Does she acquire knowledge? Or does she acquire an ability, which is called the ability hypothesis, I believe? And there's massive arguments. You have the Brian Law phenomenal concept strategy and blah, 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 blah. Massive discussions. Go read it yourself. That's not the point. The point here is, is for me to just give you some basic stuff that's happening in this field just to awaken things within you, right? 
Now, for me, my position is, you know, there's something spooky going on about consciousness. What I mean by spooky is not something that, oh, you know, magical or something that, well, it is magical, but, you know, I mean, when, when, I, when I say spooky, I'm saying our current physicalistic, naturalistic understanding of the world does not give us the right tools to understand this aspect of conscious, consciousness properly, right? So for me, you know, believing in the divine actually is a coherent, a coherent way of seeing the world because believing in the divine doesn't deny the science, accepts all the neurobiological projects and studies, but it's a metaphysical backdrop to make, you to, make, to make you understand why inner subjective consciousness is the way that it is, right? The fact that it's a first person fact, it's a reality, it's different from a physical fact, it's an inner subjective state. And it also explains why inner subjective conscious experience arises from seemingly non-conscious physical processes. The divine answer those questions. The existence of the divine answers those questions. And at the same time, you could accept all the science and all the neurobiological projects that are going on. This is like a form of integrative dualism, which you could read about yourselves. Anyway, so that's for me very interesting. But also, one would argue, well, hold on a second, Hamza. Don't we live in an AI world? Artificial intelligence, right? You know, artificial intelligence. Stephen Hawking, he said, it's, I think, I think he said this, it's one of the greatest challenges for humanity. The other guy, what's his name? Tesla man. Elon Musk, right? He said this is the greatest threat to humanity. I'm telling you, write this down. Today is the 23rd? 23rd of January, 2019. Hamza Dozi says, in Canada, in this great country, right? With great, beautiful people. MashaAllah, in this amazing place and space, within the next 10 to 20 years, human beings are going to marry robots. Oops, there you go. <laughs> That's a sign in itself. You see? They're already going to take us over. <laughs> Honestly, you think it's funny? You have some guy in Japan marrying a manga cartoon. You had a sophisticated radio program in the United Kingdom BBC Radio 4 discussing AI rights. AI rights. Yeah? You know? AI rights. As if we've solved the human rights problem, now we have another problem. The AI problem. Listen, it's in popular culture as well. Right? It's in popular culture. By the way, the Tassin's kicked in. Yeah? <laughs> so, the popular culture. You had films like, who's seen her? You know seen her? Her. Salam alaikum. So, yeah, her is brilliant. Well, yeah, in some way. A man falls in love with the operating system. And the film is designed so well that you fall in love with her as well. She's got a nice voice, she speaks really nice, she's very loving, you know. She's an operating system in some computer thing in his pocket, right? He falls in love with her and they even have intimacy. And then he gets so confused. How does she reply? How does she reply? She says, basically, don't worry. Nothing to be ashamed of. We're made of fundamentally of the same stuff. Just electrons whizzing around. That's a physicalist, nat philosophical naturalism going on here. That everything can be reduced to physical processes or explained by physical processes. And this is a big problem, because if you reduce consciousness to that, or humanity to that, you have to be intellectually just, and continue with that thought process, and follow through the logical implications. Because in reality, there is no fundamental difference between me and Robocop. Actually, Robocop is half human, so we give him that. Me and, well, give me a robot's name. What's that, the woman in Saudi, that, that robot thing? What's her name? Sophia, right? Saudi gave her citizenship. They probably don't give their own women citizenship, right? They're going to give a robot citizenship. No offense to Saudis in the room. I do, you know, no offense to any Saudis. 
Um, but anyway, the point is, the point is, right, that, what was I saying? Yeah, me and Sophia, is there any difference? If I were to get a gun and shoot Sophia in the head, the robot, and then shoot myself in the head, fundamentally, is there any difference in value? I mean, let's be honest here. Let's, you know, let's just be very, let's be intellectual. It's a university, right? Forget about being sentimental. Oh, Hamza, you're a human, and you have human rights, and you have feelings, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, that is reduced to electrons whizzing around. It's reduced to physical processes, and those physical processes are reduced to non-conscious, blind, cold electrons whizzing around. Right? Let's not get sentimental about a bunch of electrons. Let's not get sentimental by a bunch of physical processes interacting a certain way. Fundamentally, there is no intrinsic value to a bunch of electrons or physical processes causally connected in some kind of complex way. So if I shoot Sophia in the head and me in the head, fundamentally it's just a rearrangement of similar physical stuff. So, you know, this is why today's atheist, I think, is, uh, has to have a decompartmentalized mind. You can't believe in the fundamental nature of human rights and human value and have a physicalist or at least a naturalistic understanding of the world from a philosophical perspective. Because philosophical naturalism basically says there's no divine, there's no supernatural, everything, all phenomena can be reduced to physical processes. Fine, you can have your beliefs, but at least be intellectually just and follow through with the logical implication of those beliefs. And for me, the logical implications are that fundamental human rights are nonsense on stilts, as I believe Jeremy Bentham once said, if you have this world view. Because how do you ground that view? You can't just make it up. Well, actually, you can, especially in a postmodern way. <laughs> you can make anything up. It's true because I believe it. I'm a dinosaur today. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, different discussion. So, <laughs> the point here is, see, this all links. I know I'm going for here and there, but I want to plot ideas in your head so you can. Do. I might be wrong. I'm not here claiming that I'm right. I might be totally wrong, right? But at least I'm plotting some ideas in your head, in your heart, in your mind, so you can investigate further, understand the veracity and the strength of a theistic position on something so basic like consciousness. Or, or what it means to be human. Anyway, coming back to the AI thing. So can an AI ever be conscious? Because some people claim this, right? You know, we have machine learning, and computers are clever, and soon they're going to pass the Turing test, and then when you talk to them, they're going to react in a certain way that as if they're conscious. Therefore, they're conscious, and they deserve rights, and they're going to be a humanoid thing, right? Now, that is another argument to try and undermine a kind of classical view on consciousness. But I think it's a false argument, and I think Professor John Searle really solved the problem on this issue. He differentiated between strong artificial intelligence and, excuse me, weak artificial intelligence. Now, strong artificial intelligence is that artificial intelligence, like robots and stuff like that, they're going to be conscious. Weak artificial intelligence is that they will never become conscious, but they'll become very, very sophisticated, and they'll be able to do amazing things like they're, they're able to do now. And John So I think, solved the problem here because he basically said there is a difference between syntax and semantics. There's a difference between a rearrangement of symbols and attaching meaning to those symbols. Human beings can do both. We can manipulate symbols and attach meaning to symbols, but computers can only rearrange symbols. They can't attach meaning to symbols. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you three sentences. Usually, I have a whiteboard and I write this down, but I don't have a whiteboard today. But just imagine I'm writing them down. So I'm writing down, I love you, English. Second line, seni seviorum, Turkish. At the bottom, se agabo, Greek. Those sentences have different symbols, but they have the same meaning. They all mean I love you, but they're arranged in different symbols. Now, I can teach you how to write Seni Severum and how to write Se'agabo in Greek 
without you even knowing the meaning of the words, right? But I can teach you how to manipulate those symbols, in this case letters, in the right way in order to construct a meaningful sentence to someone who already knows the meaning. But you knowing the rearrangement of those letters or the symbols in the right way doesn't give rise to the meaning to you. So there is a difference between a manipulation of symbols and the understanding of the meaning. There's a difference between syntax and semantics. So let me break this down further with Professor John Searle's famous experiment. It's been debated for 30 years plus. It's called the Chinese room. Okay? So, imagine I am in a, in a room, okay? I am all alone in a room, and you guys are outside. You pictured this? So I am in my own room at the moment, you guys are outside. In this room, I have a rule book. The rule book is in the English language, okay? But it teaches me how to rearrange Chinese characters, right? So, if someone gives me questions in Chinese, I'm looking at the characters, I don't know what they mean, but I'm looking at them, and the rule book in English says, if you find this squiggly thing and another squiggly thing, then produce these squiggly things, all right? So I'm following in the rule book in English, and any questions I'm getting in Chinese from you, the audience, imagine you all know Chinese, yeah? I follow the rule book in English to manipulate the symbols and I produce other symbols that I don't know what they mean but I do it and it's correct and I pass them outside of the room. Every time you give me a question in Chinese, I give you the right answer in Chinese as well because I've used the rule book in English that's teaching me how to manipulate the symbols without me knowing the meaning. So, you not knowing that I have a rule book, do you think I know Chinese? Yes, because I'm always getting it right. Oh, the guy in there knows Chinese, right? Correct. But do I know Chinese? Do I know Chinese? No, because there is no way of me attaching meaning to the symbols. And that is the same with computers. Computers can manipulate symbols. They can deal with the syntax, not the semantics. They can't attach meaning to the symbols. Now there is a reply, it's called the systems reply. One would argue, okay Hamza, the question is, fine, you don't know Chinese, but you, the rule book, and the whole room together as a system knows Chinese. Hold on a second. This doesn't make sense because there is no way for the system to attach meaning to the symbols. So from this point of view, this basically differentiates between hard AI, strong AI, and weak AI. So AI can never be fully conscious in the way that we that we are from that point of view. So that's another very powerful thought experiment in the philosophy of the mind. And yes, just like with lots of academic stuff, there's loads of discussions on this, loads of debates, loads of nuances, but that's not my job today to give you that. My job is just to give you, remember, plant intellectual seeds in your heart and mind, start thinking about these things, okay? To move you away from Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that, yeah? So, that's consciousness. So for me, I think, the divine reality, God himself, is really a coherent explanation for that thing which makes us human. Not only to explain consciousness and our inner subjective conscious states, but also to explain the value that we have as conscious beings. That there is a difference, a fundamental difference between myself and Sophia the robot because of this worldview. I have the correct lenses on my eyes in order to understand the world. This is my first principle, my metaphysics. But if we adopt a physicalistic understanding, or if we adopt philosophical naturalism, then we have to follow through with the bleak and with the cold moral and existential implications, which are, well, there is no fundamental difference. And we will never be able to answer the, the question of inner subjective conscious states. So that's consciousness for you. Now this leads to worship. Now you may think, well, how on earth does this lead to worship? Well, given the fact that we're conscious, there's something going on here, right? Because consciousness, our conscious moments, are a massive gift. Here's another thought experiment. 
Imagine you're all billionaires, right? And unfortunately, you have 10 minutes left to live. But someone comes along and says, in order for you to get another 10 days, you have to give me all of your wealth. I think most of you will give me all of your wealth. Or give that person all of your wealth. All of your wealth. And for me, that goes to show how priceless our conscious existence is. This gift of life. That's what we say in popular culture. Life is a gift. So, these conscious moments are priceless. But we receive this priceless gift freely at every moment of our existence. And we don't own these moments. You can't even create a fly. You don't earn these moments. And you don't necessarily deserve another conscious moment of your life. So if it's true that we receive this gift of life at every moment of our existence that's priceless, that we don't earn, own, or deserve, how should it make you feel? Do you want me to repeat the question? So if we receive something that is priceless, at every moment of our existence that we don't earn, own, or deserve, how should it make us feel? Who is it grateful? Absolutely. Gratitude. And what's very interesting in the Islamic spiritual tradition, gratitude is a key that opens the door to worship. Because worship in Islam means to know God, to love God, to obey God, and to direct all acts of worship to God alone. And one of them is ultimate gratitude. This is why the summary of the Qur'an is in the first chapter. And the first line of the summary of the Qur'an says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All perfect gratitude and thanks belongs to the Lord of everything that exists. Gratitude is the key to worship. And if we really have this understanding in our lives, everything changes. Everything changes. Because you're not going to be thinking about, yo, I deserve that bigger house, right? And I deserve that job, right? And we walk around life having a chip on our shoulder as if the whole world owes us something, right? You know, we live in this kind of reality of, you know, where's my rights? You know, forget about anybody else. Think about me, yeah? We have this really kind of egocentric attitude to life, yeah? So it puts everything into perspective. It's like anything above a heartbeat is a bonus. Imagine you lived your life like that. What kind of life would you have? You'd have wings, man. Not real wings, but you know, like proper wings, right? And I'm not talking about the new legalization of cannabis, yeah? <laughs> In Canada. I'm talking about existential wings, yeah? So, <laughs> the point is, if, you, if, you, if, if this would dramatically change everything, right? Your whole perspective on life. So. This is very important to understand because Islam, it's, it's the raison d'etre, the reason for existence concerning the human being, as per what the Qur'an says, is actually we're here to worship God. And as I said, worship entails knowing Him, loving Him, obeying Him and directing acts of worship to Him alone, which includes gratitude. So understanding this gift of consciousness, notwithstanding all the philosophical stuff that we just mentioned, you know, you know, it just logically follows. If we do receive something that's priceless, that we don't earn, own, or deserve, and we receive it every moment of our existence, then uh, we should be grateful. But grateful to who? Grateful to the one who gave you these conscious moments. And that fundamentally is a song. Giving thanks, right? So, that's consciousness. Second thing, because I'm supposed to talk about consciousness, Morality and love, okay? So one down, two to go. Right. Another thought experiment. Imagine this is a screen, a television screen. You're watching Fox News, right? And you come back from work or school and you're really, really tired and all of a sudden you see this news flash. And the news flash says, Man beheads five-year-old. Is this an evil act? Put your hand up if you believe it's evil. Someone's confused. <laughs> Someone's confused. Someone left the moral compass on their pillow this morning. <laughs> okay, so 
It's an evil act, correct? Yes. Good, okay. Next question. Is it objectively evil? Put your hand up. Okay, good, most of you. Right. Hear me out here. If you believe there is some objective good and some objective evil, then it necessitates the divine. It necessitates God's existence. This is called moral realism or meta-ethics in philosophy. But forget the big words for now. The point is, beheading a five-year-old is not only evil, it's objectively evil. And what objectively evil or objectively good means, it means that it transcends human subjectivity. It's not based on the limited human mind and limited emotions. It transcends that. Because if the whole world were to come and agree that killing a five-year-old is good, you would still say it's wrong. It transcends human subjectivity. Just like the Nazi Germanys, when they said it's okay to annihilate Jews, right? There was a consensus in Germany, a quasi-consensus. We still say, no, it's wrong. So, objective moral truths, right? Objective moral truths are objective from the point of view that they're outside of the limited mind of human emotion. This means they require some kind of grounding, a foundation. What explains the fact that this moral fact is objective and where did it come from? Those two questions are questions relating to moral ontology, okay? Meta-ethics. So, let me repeat that. If you believe something to be objective, by the way, it doesn't have to be all morals, but if some morals, even one, if you believe it to be objectively good or objectively evil, from the perspective that is outside of the limited mind of human emotions, it requires some kind of foundation. What explains that moral value to be objective? And where did it come from? These two questions are important. Okay? My argument is, my thesis is that if you do believe in objective moral truths, some objective moral truths, then God must exist because God is the only being that transcends human subjectivity and God's commands provide the basis for those moral truths and the objectivity for those moral truths, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. But you may argue, hold on a second, Hamza, there are alternatives. Damn right there are alternatives, there's quite a few, and we can't talk about them all night, but let's talk about the main moral alternatives, and you could research yourself, research for yourself further later on. The two alternatives are, which is becoming quite popular in Canadian academic discourse, especially on YouTube and other places, is biology and social pressure. Right. Who would support the idea that biology is actually an adequate foundation for objective moral truth? Yes, so my question is, who would support the idea that biology, whether it's in the form of the Darwinian mechanism by natural selection or some other kind of understanding you have of biology, that biology itself is an adequate foundation for objective moral truths? Sorry? He's not here to defend himself, Okay, good. So, you're right. Biology does explain our capacity to formulate ethical rules. Absolutely. No one is denying that. Biology can explain our ability and capacity to formulate ethical rules. It could be because of pressure. The pressure of natural selection. Survival of the fittest. Whatever the case may be. No problem. However, this doesn't provide an explanation or a foundation for objective moral truths. Why am I saying this? Well, take the words of Darwin himself. He basically said that if we were reared under precisely the same conditions as the hive bees, we would think it's okay to kill our fertile daughters. Likewise, if you extend this to another thought experiment, 
if we were reared under precisely the same conditions as the nurse shark, we would think it's okay to rape women. That's what the nurse shark does. It bites the fin of its mate and it wrestles with its mate. Go check that National Geographic, right? <laughs> so if we're reared under precisely the same conditions as these things, like the hive bees or the nurse shark or whatever the case may be, then our, what we understand to be objectively moral will be totally different. What this does is objective morality now loses any meaning because it is now contingent on biological conditions. And those biological conditions can change over a long period of time, which by definition means they're not objective anymore. So it doesn't provide a basis for objective moral truths. It can explain our capacity to formulate ethical rules, but it doesn't provide an objective basis, uh, a basis for objective moral truths and value at all. So I think biology is not working here. So we have the other alternative that we're going to discuss today. Social pressure. We're human beings, bro. We come together and we agree on things. That makes it objective. Right? I think there is a problem here as well because you can have scenarios where human beings got together and they actually had a consensus on things that were objectively evil. Right? So therefore, game over. And if you study societies, societies change. You know, the social norms change. If you study social psychology, you look into informational social influence, normative social influence. We have a need to belong. We have a need to feel certain. And those things basically, you know, help develop the social norm. And those things can change over time. If you study social constructionism, maybe Vivian Burke, for example, there are intellectual structures in society, language itself, politics, influentials that can dictate social discourse, right? And that can shape even your moral intuitions or your, your moral outlook, right? So, and that can change over time. Just look at society 30 years ago. Game over. And that's the most happened, right? I'm not passing moral judgment. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's worse. You could make your own mind about what's happening these days. All right? <laughs> yeah? So, do you see my point? So, the reason God provides that explanation is because God as an idea is a being that transcends human subjectivity. He has the totality of moral knowledge. In Islam, he is al bar meaning, that's his name, meaning the source of goodness. He's Al-Hakim, the wise. He has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. He's Al-Alim. The knowing that he has total knowledge. So he has total moral knowledge. And this is his nature. His nature is good. So his commands are a derivative of his nature. His commands not only explain objective goodness, because God by definition is objective because he has total knowledge, total moral, moral knowledge. And, and, so his commands explain the objective nature of morals, and it explains... Why are they good in the first place? Because God is good. Now you may argue, isn't there a famous you three fold dilemma that talks to the theist and says, hold on a second, there's, there's a bit of a dilemma going on. And I want you to solve the dilemma, see if you can solve the dilemma. So, you three fold dilemma is as follows. Fair enough, Hamza, you say it's God's commands. Maybe, I, let's, let's give you that, that God is objective. Because he has total moral knowledge. Moral knowledge. Fair enough. But we have a problem. The problem is this. Oh, not just that. God transcends human subjectivity, of course. You know, he's outside of the universe, so he can make the universal moral claim. No problem. But we have an issue. And the issue is, is it good because God commanded it? Or is it good because the commands of God are good? You have a dilemma. Why is it a dilemma? Well, let me just repeat the dilemma before you explain it. So on one hand, well, is it good because God commanded it? Now that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Because morality becomes arbitrary. It could be that God could command that we should kill all 55-year-olds. 
And there you go. It's good because there's an arbitrary command. And the subtlety here is it assumes that God's commands are dislocated away from his nature. They're just arbitrary. And it also means that if you accept this part of the dilemma, that there should be nothing in the cosmos that you should believe to be objectively morally good or evil. So that's the problem. We can't accept that. The argument falls. Let's go to the other side of the dilemma. Okay, it's good because the commands of good are good. Woohoo! We solved the problem. Now you have it. Think about it. It's good because the commands of God are good. What's the problem with this part of the dilemma? Who's thinking today? Yes, good now is outside of God. You got the same problem again. You haven't solved the problem. Because good now is outside of God. It's an external reference to God. And you're saying, well, I already know what good is, and I'm judging God's commands. But didn't you say that God's commands are a foundation for good? But you're now having an external thing, an external goodness, criteria for goodness, if you like, a reference point for goodness, to judge God's commands. So you haven't solved the problem. So how do you solve the dilemma? Who can do it? Yes, sir. Yeah, of course it does. Yeah. But it refutes the idea that God's commands are a basis for, for objective morality. That's the point we're talking about. So how do we deal with that issue? Yes, sir. Could it be that um, God has said good and evil standards separately, and then his uh, commands are based off of that? Mm, no, because good becomes external to God still. That's the problem. Yes, but the dilemma is actually saying that God's commands are good. That's one part of the dilemma, yeah. right? So you must have a kind of criteria outside of God to judge His commands. Or the other part is, well, what God commands is good. No, sorry, the other part of the dilemma is, now you're confusing me. <laughs> So it's jet lag, beginning. So let's just start from the beginning. So the dilemma goes, is it good because God commanded it? Or are the commands of, is it good because the commands of God are good? So the first part of the dilemma is, is it good because God commanded it? Then good becomes arbitrary, right? Because God could command, hypothetically, to kill anyone over the age of 55. And it means that there should be nothing in the universe that you should, that you should perceive as objectively good or evil in the first place, right? The other part of the dilemma is, well, it's because the commands of God are good. Well, if that's the case, where is that good coming from that you're talking about? It can't be from God's commands because you're judging God's commands with that goodness. Right? So how do you solve the dilemma? Yes? So um, so my understanding is whatever God commands is good, and he would never command anything that is bad. But I mean, the only the only way... Where does that good and bad come from? know that is if you can establish that whatever this command is coming from is divine in nature. No, so not really. Not true, because you're assuming the divine has some kind of qualities. You have to presuppose that. Yes, sir? Uh, All-knowing. All-knowing, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, please. Let's have one conversation in the room, yeah? Let's try and have one conversation in the room. Yeah. If God's all-knowing, He knows everything, He doesn't make mistakes. It's perfect. He knows everything. It's not the same. Okay, that's, that's close. It's close. We're getting this slowly. Yes, sir? What if God just gives commands and then good is and bad is something that we create in ourselves? Okay, well, if you follow that route, then everything becomes subjective anyway. And that means, in the beginning, you should never put your hand up and say that killing a five-year-old is objectively morally wrong. We can't have a cake and eat it. If you live your life and practically that there are some objectively good and objectively evil things, then follow through the logical consequences. Just because you can't solve the problem now, now you give up more realism. Like, okay, I think it's subjective now. Okay, if that's the case, 
There's a double-edged sword. And I like that. But if you're an atheist and now you give up more realism, then fine. So when you point the finger at religious discourse, it's going to be subject to, you know, it's like, you know, having a cake. You don't like that cake. Get another cake. No problem. Yeah? Do you see the point? It's a double-edged sword. So you can reject moral reason, you can reject the fact that there, are, that there is anything objective in the universe that is good or evil. If you do that, then fine. Follow through the logical implications. But when you point the finger at the KKK or ISIS, it has to be a little small finger saying, you know, maybe they're evil. Yeah? <laughs> do you see my point? Double edged sword, bro. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely, young lady. That's the one. Preach, sister. Preach. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, God is good. That's how you break the dilemma. Good is actually part of his nature. So it's not external to him. It's part of him in that sense. Even in the Islamic tradition, we say Allah is al bar He is the source of all goodness, right? So his command are a derivative of who he is. But there is a follow-up question to this. And let's see if you get this answer. Okay, that's not a dilemma. Fair enough. It's not good because God just commanded it, because his commands are not dislocated from his nature. And it's not that God's commands are good, because good is not external to his commands. It's actually God is good, and what he commands is connected to who he is. Even Allah says in the Quran, he doesn't command evil, right? Why? Because he has a nature, right? And part of that nature is that he is good. So his commands are derivative of that goodness. So it's not an arbitrary moral standard. It's actually contained, it's, it's, it's within him if you want to use such language. Now, here's the question. How do you know God is good? How do you know God is good? Who said that? What does belief mean? Do you mean belief in a philosophical sense? Like this is a water bottle, very mundane belief? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean faith? Like, oh, I think there's a water bottle. I mean, what do you mean by belief? Think about it and come back to me, no problem. Yes, sir. Uh, I think um, when it comes to defining the nature and attributes of God, I mean, philosophy is riddled with conjecture as to what God could be, what the implication in Western philosophy that there's a Judeo Christian God. But the paradigm, I guess, that we want to look at it as primarily as Muslims from the Islamic point of view is what defines that paradigm, and that's where we bring revelation. Yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, you know, depends what kind of school of creed you follow, because one would argue that there is an innate nature within you that has a basic understanding, a form of knowing that acknowledges God. Like the fetra is that innate disposition. Are you going to say the innate disposition of the human being thinks that God is not good? I mean, that would be a violation of one's human nature, in my view, yeah? So it's not as simple as just going to Revelation, uh, because you have to. It, it, it's, Obviously, primarily to know who God is, you go straight to Revelation. Absolutely agree. But there are certain things like the perfection of God. You don't need Revelation to tell you God is perfect. Do you see? Because many of the scholars would say, well, that understanding of God's perfection is already fitting, meaning it's already part of his innate nature. One's innate nature knows that God is perfect, right? So he has perfect goodness. Well, the question I have here now, well, how do you know he's, he's perfectly good? Without revelation. Well, for me, God is the only being worthy of worship. And the only being worthy of worship is the highest moral being. That would me, for me, that would be the most intelligent way of answering that question. Nevertheless, well done, young lady. It was very good. So, if you believe in objective good and objective evil, not all morality is objectively good or objectively evil, but if you believe in at least one or two, like the one that we spoke about in the beginning, then it necessitates God's existence, right? Finally, so we spoke about consciousness, we spoke about morality, now we're speaking about love. You know, there was a famous poet that spoke about love, and the poet basically said that 
When the pen writes about love, it breaks in two. <laughs> I'm actually listening to a book. It's called The Five Languages of Love. I don't know if you've read that book. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, love is a very profound, profound reality in life. You know? And I don't know if you have children or nieces or nephews, but don't you have the feeling when a newborn comes into your family, you're like, as if you loved them all your life, although they've just come into your life? Have you ever had that feeling before? You know, Rumi, the famous poet, not that I agree with everything he says, but he has some insights concerning love. He made a really good point. He said, you know, true lovers don't fall in love. They were already in love before they met. Yeah? And I think that's how a parent is with their, their children. Like, you know, with my children, I'm like, where have you been all my life, you know? I've loved you forever, when you just came into my life, right? So love is very, very deep, and there's different forms of love, of course. There's the kind of natural love that you have for your parents and your brothers and sisters, and, you know, you may hate them to bits because you don't like them, you don't get along, but you still love them, yeah? You know, she's the auntie that calls only when there's a disaster or when she needs something. But you know what? You love her because she's your auntie, man. Yeah? So, you know, you have that natural love for your parents, for your siblings, for your family. And that is, you know, a, there is a strong connection and it's, it's a natural form of love. Then you have another form of love, which in Greek language is like a philia. A philia is like a friendship, which sometimes can have a different depth to it because... You choose your friends, willingly, right? You know, and that's quite special. And you have, you have shared experiences. And you may not agree all the time, but by virtue of the fact that you're traversing the path of life together, and you have these shared experiences, and you're slightly intertwined together in some way, that creates some kind of connection, yeah? And that's a loving connection you have with your friends, right? And it's a special form of love. And I mean true friendship, by the way. I don't mean, um, you know, the people who always, you know, say good things about me. No, that's not true friendship. Oh, you're so nice today. You're so pretty. Yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> no, yeah. No, 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 no. True friends are the friends that shout at you. Like my grand would always say that your true friends shout at you. They're like, hey, how's your spirituality today? I noticed a little bit of ego this morning, yeah? I want the best for you, you know? That kind of friendship, which is very hard to have. And by the way, there's hardly any true friends anymore, yeah? Because we always want to please each other all the time. If we're not friends anymore. We're like almost social business partners. And our capital, our capital is social gain or status in some way. Isn't it true? When's the last time your best friend actually sat you down and told you off about, you know, you know, blemishes of your character and did it in a way that wants to elevate you. Very rare. And if you have such a friend, don't let them go. Don't let them go. Yeah? Anyway, so talk about true friendship. And then there's other forms of love. You know, love between a husband and a wife or a partner, whatever the case may be. You know, that's a very kind of intimate and passionate and kind of, you know, spiritual type of love. And then you have love for the divine. All these amazing things. But one thing I want to focus on today is self-love, right? Now, what I mean by self-love is not a kind of egoistic love, like a narcissism. You always look in the mirror and say, oh, so amazing. <laughs> None of that stuff. None of that stuff, right? It's the type of love that's a mature love. And it's the type of love that Eric Fromm talks about in his book, The Art of Loving. I suggest you read that book. It's a very interesting book. And it's the type of love that the 11th century theologian Al-Ghazali spoke about in his 36th book of his magnum opus, his Idya, his revival of the religious sciences. His 36th book is called Love, Intimacy, and Contentment with God. And in that, he talks about self-love, not in a narcissistic way, but in a way that it means that you want good for yourself, right? And you know, the closest thing to you is you. And if you can't love you, then how can you love anybody else in reality, right? So this is why he even mentions in his Alchemy of Happiness, another book, when he says, you know, knowing yourself is like knowing your Lord, right? He says this is a prophetic tradition. It's not a prophetic tradition, but there's some meaning. There's some sound meaning behind this. Because if you know that you're limited, you know God is 
unlimited from that point of view. There's nothing that limits him. If you know that you're contingent, you know God is necessary. If you know you're weak in some way, you know God is maximally perfect, right? So knowing yourself is like, helped you know the divine. Anyway, the point is, we want to love ourselves from the point of view that we want goodness. We want pleasure, we don't want pain. That's the whole point of paradise and hell. To warn you and to show you what the good news is about, right? Human beings want pleasure, they don't want pain. Even people who seem altruistic. Rachel Corey, who got bulldozed by a certain entity. You can say in Canada, you sure? By the Zionists, right? <laughs> you know, she got bulldozed, she got murdered because she was defending the Palestinians. She was there. You yeah, are so altruistic. Yeah, but it's a form of altruism that was good for her because she wanted pleasure. Because the pain of not doing anything was far greater than the pain of doing something. That's the point. So when people are altruistic, really they're selfish in a profound way. Right? So when you're compassionate, you're actually being selfish, but in a very mature way, because your compassion is pleasurable to you. And not being compassionate is painful. So the point is, we want good for ourselves. So Al-Ghazali says, if you want good for yourself, if you love yourself, then you have to love God. Why? And he argues that if you have self-love, it must lead to the love of the divine, because who created you? Who created the physical causes in the universe that you manipulate and use in order to achieve pleasure and run away from pain? Who is the source of love? Whose name is the loving? Allah's name in the Quran is Al-Wudud, coming from the Arabic word Wud, which means a loving that is giving. Allah is excessively loving. And God's love is so excessive and pure, it's even purer than anything we can imagine, even a mother's love. Because when a mother loves, she needs to love because it completes her. God doesn't require completion. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't gain anything by loving because He is al -ghani. He is independent and free, yet He loves. Imagine how pure that love is. So if we love ourselves, we have to love the divine. You know, if I said to you that someone who's going to come into this room is the most loving thing in the world, loving human being, you're going to be like, I don't even get to know that person. But God's love transcends any type of kind of anthropomorphic love that we can imagine, right? So, love is powerful, huh? That got you going, isn't it? It was like, like, you know, thinking about these important issues. So, and love in the Islamic tradition is, is, is worship, is a form of worship. Um, so, what have we spoken about today? We spoke about God's gifts. We spoke about consciousness from the point of view of the hard problem of consciousness that raises two questions. The epistemic question and the ontological question. The question of, you know, how do we know what it's like for Muhammad to have a blueberry? He has an inner subject of conscious experience. If we know everything about his brain, it doesn't lead to knowledge of his inner subjective conscious experience. Also, we don't know why inner subjective conscious experiences arise from seemingly non-conscious physical processes. Physicalism or philosophical naturalism doesn't really address that, but having an understanding of the divine addresses that question and accepts all the science. Then we moved on about talking about value and the gift of consciousness, that that should lead to gratitude, and gratitude is a form of worship, because you know it's a priceless gift that's given to us freely at every moment of our existence, yet we don't earn it, own it, or deserve it. Then we moved on to morality, you know, if we believe that beheading a five-year-old is evil and it's objectively evil from the point of view that's outside of the limited individual human mind and, and human emotions, then it requires some kind of grounding. This is moral realism, moral ontology, meta-ethics, right? What explains its objective nature and where did it come from? We agree that it can't be social pressure, it can't be biology, it, it's, it's the command of God. Then we spoke about love, right? And, you know, self-love leads to the love of the divine, which is a form of worship. So there's many concepts that we, we introduced to you today, many different thoughts, experiments from Frank Jackson, from Professor Sell, and all of these amazing things. But, you know, I will have to be intellectually honest. I haven't covered even the topics 
in detail because there's so much going on in the philosophy of mind, so much going on in, 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 in ethics and meta ethics, so much, so much going on, it's ridiculous, right? But my point here wasn't to give you a robust philosophical case for that. We need weeks and twos and throws and discussions. But the job, I think, of myself is to try and plant seeds in your heart and mind to create some awakenings. That awakening could be, Hamza's totally wrong. That awakening can be, something resonated with me, let me investigate further. That awakening could be, you know, whatever. The point is, is to create those awakenings so we start to think about, you know, critical concepts and topics in a very profound way. So we can awaken that truth within, because fundamentally, this is why I really believe and this is my tradition of Islamic theology, is that every human being is born with an innate nature. In the Islamic tradition, it's called the fitrah. And the innate nature has forms of knowledge, primary knowledge. And, and it's basically two aspects of knowledge. Number one, that God is a reality. And number two, that he deserves praise. But that fitrah, that innate nature gets clouded. Okay? It gets clouded because of education, because of socialization, because of society, because of all of these things. And what we need to do is learn to uncloud the fitrah to awaken the truth within. And it could be through lectures like this. It could be by buying someone a pizza. You don't know what can awaken the truth within for someone. So this is why I deliver conversational types of lectures now to ask you questions to get you to think because thinking itself and even exploring these matters may be able to awaken that truth within rather than giving you some kind of abstract deductive argument. As Al-Ghazali, the, the 11th century theologian, he says something very profound and wise. He said, don't think that your spiritual conviction is going to come as a result of some deductive argument. Someone smarter than you can change your premises. What are you going to do? He said, true iman, from that point of view, true conviction will come through experiencing the Quran, experiencing Islam in your life. <coughs> which is a different kettle of fish, right? So, thank you very much for listening. So, question and answers. Yes, sir. Well, it depends what your metaphysics are. What's your first principles? If you believe that there is no divine and you have total self-ownership, then yeah. But if you believe actually the divine gave you consciousness, then it's not yours by definition. Right? Okay. The question? So the question was that can't you argue that you own your own consciousness because I am me and therefore I own me? Well, fundamentally from an Islamic point of view, you don't own anything, <laughs> right? So this is part of what you call the Tawheed of God's creative power, also known as the Tawheed, the oneness of his Rububiya, the oneness of his creative power, that he owns everything, and he is the source and master sustainer of everything that exists, exists including your consciousness. So our first principles, our metaphysics, our lenses upon our eyes to understand the world, is that you don't own nothing, fundamentally, right? And uh, you're not the source of anything, God is the source, and God created you, right? Um, so from that point of view, we don't have that kind of um, um, first principle. And this is why when people ask the question, hey, I wasn't given consent to come here and to be tested in the world. So why is God under any more obligation to give you consent, mate? He created you. If I create a Lego toy, I don't ask the Lego toy, do you give me consent to make you? No, it's my toy, right? And I know that sounds like a crude example, but I think you're getting the point here. The question assumes that you have that kind of self-ownership. That you own you. You don't. Allah owns you. God owns you because he created you. So that question doesn't even apply. Right? So you have to understand the false assumptions behind questions sometimes. But anyway, to answer your question directly, no, because our first principle is that God created your consciousness, therefore you don't own it. Yes, sir? Okay, good. Thank you for being very patient. Yeah. Um, I've attended a lot of sessions, but uh, there seems to be uh, no answer that to uh, to give that uh, some satisfaction. Um, you mentioned about uh, the notion of uh, gratitude uh, being grateful 
That's impossible to, to try to try and um, articulate. So the problem here is, if there is a divine wisdom, then it follows there is a reason. Now you may argue, but I can't see the wisdom. So that's an argument from ignorance. It's another logical fallacy. Argument about ignorance. Just because you can't see the wisdom, it doesn't mean there's no wisdom. Then the normal argument, that's a combat number. Is it really a combat? It's not a combat because we're talking about the nature of the divine. You are, you are the one attacking our concept of God. Attack the true concept of God because he's also the wise. And referring to his wisdom is not a combat because that's who he is. And you can't have your cake and eat it, Mr. Atheist. Because don't you submit to the wisdom and authority of things without knowing the wisdom and authority or the wisdom behind it? I was on a plane that was turbulent. What did the pilot say? The pilot said, fasten your seatbelt. I didn't say, what do you know? And start moonwalking on the aisle. No! I submitted to the authority of the pilot, even though I don't know much about turbulence. When I go to the doctor and I give them my symptoms, I don't know nothing about medicine. I didn't study seven to ten years. Right? I did. But I submit to the authority of the medic. And these are not ultimate authorities. God is the ultimate authority. So don't say it's a cop out submitting to a wisdom. You do it all the time. And it's not irrational. So the point is the first assumption is a false assumption. A false assumption that God is only good and powerful. The other false assumption is that God hasn't given us any good reason. Why there is evil and suffering? God has. If you look at what God revealed, the Quran and the prophetic tradition, God says, life is supposed to be full of suffering. That's the point. Life is a test. You will be tested with good and with evil. How you respond good with good when good happens, and how you respond when evil happens. Life is a test. If you want eternal bliss, that's paradise, yeah? Life is full of evil and suffering. And the way we deal with evil and suffering is going to facilitate our real life in the hereafter. So one key reason why there's evil and suffering in the world is for us to be tested so there is a mechanism for us to go to paradise. Otherwise, God is treating Hitler and the pious prophets as exactly the same, which is totally against any notion of justice or morality. Yeah? There must be a mechanism to facilitate who goes to paradise. And one such mechanism is the presence of evil and suffering in the world. So I don't think the problem is a philosophical problem, though. To be honest, it's not. It just doesn't logically follow that God now is not good or powerful. It's an emotional problem. So let's try and solve the emotional problem, yeah? Look, evil is evil because we give meaning to the evil. Right? We give meaning to evil. We tell a story about what's happened. For example, when I was a kid, five years old, I used to look at my granddad, he used to drink this thick gold liquid. It looked amazing. Liquid gold. I found out later it was called whiskey. Right? <laughs> so, I try to get that and basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing my, 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 my history, yeah? It's a long time ago. I'm 38 now, so, you know, I, I, I may be adding some spice to the story, yeah? But the point is, I want that liquid gold. My mom and dad told me off. No, Andrea. No. Right? Typical Greek parents. No. Oki. Yeah? No. I'm like, what? Why are they so evil? Parents are so evil. I want that liquid gold. They're saying no. I don't have access to, uh, to their wisdom. My story over that evil is, or the apparent evil is, my parents are so evil, they wanted me to have liquid gold. That's the story I am telling myself over that evil. So how do I deal with that evil? By telling myself a different story. So I can tell the story in a different way. I can say, my parents know more than me. And you know, my parents really love me. They fed me and they clothed me for these five years. They put me to bed, they stroke my hair, they say they love me, and they're quite affectionate to me. I don't understand why I can't have that gold liquid, but by virtue of the fact that they love me, there's a history of love, and by virtue of the fact that they know more than me, 
then it's not evil, because I trust my parents. So do you see the story I'm telling myself now? So, you know, it's not easy to obey. You know, I don't get emotional about these things. I was a very beautiful brother today, he's picking up in the airport, and I love this him. And, you know, he told me a story that choked me up a bit. Um, you know, his child passed away after a few days when she was born. And, you know, it's the, one of the most greatest, when you, when you become a father or a parent, one of the most greatest tests you could ever face in your life is your children passing away. I don't think there's anything else that scares me most than something happening to my children. Yeah? And, you know, I tried to say something nice, but he's more pious than he already knows this, but I was basically trying to say, your child's going to be putting you into paradise, because that's our tradition, you know? Look at the meaning we can now give to that evil. Apparent suffering. Do you see the meaning here? So imagine we didn't have that narrative, that spiritual narrative that we know is true. Imagine we had the narrative of, I don't know, a philosophical naturalist. Fundamentally, he has no value, no meaning. Your emotions and pains can be reduced to cold, non conscious, physical processes. Your child is dead, get over it kind of thing. But the meaning we can give to that evil is, or that suffering in our life is, in the grand scheme of things, there's so much goodness in this, because my child is going to be bringing me to paradise, which is eternal bliss. And paradise in Islamic tradition is, is that if someone were to suffer their whole life, and they were to be dipped in paradise, they'll be asked, did you ever suffer? And they would say, oh my, my God, I've never suffered. Now that's a different story, right? That's a fundamentally different story or different meaning you are giving to evil and suffering in your life. For example, when a Muslim suffers and they go through pain, that pain is seen in a totally different way, bro. Those tests and trials are actually seen in some kind of intuitively paradoxical way as a sign of God's love. Because the Prophet Muhammad upon him, he said, if God tests you, he loves you. So you see evil and suffering in your life as a form of divine love. Because you see it as a process of purifying you spiritually because the end goal is going to be eternal love in paradise. That's a different story. That's a different meaning. So bro, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, the 14th century theologian, it's all good, bro. It is literally all good. There's evil happening around the world, kids are dying, kids getting cancer, people getting tortured, evil's gonna happen, but in the grand cosmic scheme of things, everything is for a divine good wisdom. And that's how a Muslim sees the world. This doesn't mean that you're gonna be insensitive to evil and not deal with the problems. No, because we're commanded to deal with problems and to command the good and forbid the evil and do all of these things and help humanity. You know, one of the the best thing you do as a Muslim is to help human beings, irrespective of their background. That's what a Muslim does, right? But the point is, I'm trying to show to you that sometimes we think a problem is philosophical when really it's emotional, or it's experiential, or existential. And the way to deal with this is by looking into the, our tradition. It's so rich in terms of how to deal with evil and suffering. And it's very empowering as well. God says, God doesn't burden the soul more than it can bear, right? So God who knows you more than you know yourself is saying, yes, you're going for evil, but you know what? You have the power to take control of all this. You have the power to give it meaning, the right meaning, God's meaning, and it becomes your meaning. You see? So you'll be able to deal with the suffering. And I, and I see this all the time. You know, very pious Muslims who lose their job. Alhamdulillah. All perfect gratitude belongs to, to God. I lost my left leg. Alhamdulillah, I have my right leg. I lost both my legs. Alhamdulillah, I have my arm. I lost both my arm. How I'm alive? You know? And this has been proven scientifically in studies. People who become disabled, for the first few months, they may, may be sad. But after a year, they live with happiness like everybody else. Right? So the point here is, bro, is what meaning are you giving to the evil of suffering? Change the meaning. And my advice would be give the meaning that God in his messenger gives the meaning. 
gives me to the field of suffering. And you'll be able to transcend any type of field of suffering, inshallah. Yeah? So, you know, hope that answers your question. No worries. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is good. So it's like the famous Tiananmen Square massacre. So, you know, you the famous picture of the Chinese student sitting in front of the three tanks that's about to bulldoze the, chi the Chinese student. Now, who's courageous? The Chinese student. Who are the cowards? The army. You only know that because you have that difference. You can only know what courage is if there is the basic level of evil, which is cowardice, right? So, in order to have a higher good, then there must be a lower level of evil. So yeah, this is called like first order good, second order good, first order evil, second order evil. Like for, for you to know what compassion is, you need to know its opposite. Yeah, so that, that is an argument. There are issues with that philosophically somewhere, but generally speaking, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good line to take as well from that point of view. Do you want to wrap up? Any other questions from the floor? Any pending questions? Yes, sister. Um, it's kind of a big question, and we don't have time to answer it. Um, the question is, uh, why you chose Islam and how did you come to Islam? Why I chose Islam? It's a good question. Maybe Islam chose me. He just found me, yeah? I don't know. Um, okay, look, right, so... Your presence is making me feel very uncomfortable. All right. <laughs> I will leave you be for now. <laughs> I will extend your time. So, you know, you know, everyone's on a journey, yeah? Because, you know, when you ask me this question, I just look back, I think it's about 16, 17 years ago when I became a Muslim, and I'm like, you know, am I the same person 16 years ago? No. Am I the same person three years ago? I bloody hope no. So everyone is on that kind of journey. So my answer now to why I'm a Muslim is not the same answer I would have gave 16 years ago. Yeah? So I don't want to be dishonest to you by giving you some kind of romantic answer. Oh, it was amazing. Because it wasn't. Um, life is going to kick you in the mouth. It's going to be dark and you're going to be trying to find your teeth. Yeah? So, and you just have to deal with it. So I, I became Muslim, I think, because I was somewhat convinced intellectually well, I didn't even know much, but for me, it, from my limited understanding at that time, I thought I was convinced. But for me, it was a little bit more powerful because that conviction wasn't enough. I needed to experience some of the tradition, so I learned how to pray. Um, and I also, I always knew that prayer wasn't just actions. There was an internal dimension to prayer. For example, my friends, my Muslim friends would say, when you're in prostration, you're closer to your Lord. You know, the face is like the symbol of the ego, isn't it, yeah? And your, your face hits the floor. And that's what's very interesting about Islamic spirituality, which basically, it doesn't say add to yourself, it says remove, because you're already good. Why are you adding to yourself? The whole point of, you know, if you look at the Islamic spiritual practices, they're very God-centric, like remembrance of God. He is the highest. He is the greatest. He transcends everything. SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, right? It's not about you, it's about God. Right? And it's about making you realize that you're nothing. God is everything. And you may think that's very disempowering, but it's not, because in that nothingness you find your true self. You basically, you know, you peel away, you know, the layers of the ego. And that's what salah does, that's what prayer does, that's what dhikr does. That's what all of these Islamic spiritual practices do. They peel away the layers of the ego to reveal the true self. Because the true self in Islam is the fitrah, is that pristine goodness. 
And, and that, for me, was, you know, a different reality. So I used to pray. And I remember my friend saying, you know, the closest you are to God is in prostration, so speak to him. So I'll be like, what's going on? Sort me out, kind of thing. And then, you know, I made the decision. And then throughout my journey, there's been ups and many downs, uh, probably more downs than ups, but that's life. And, you know, I've learned that Islam is not just a belief. And this is very important to understand. And I always mention this in nearly every talk now, even if the talk has nothing to do with belief. Yeah? So Islam is not just a belief. Because the belief can be very mundane. It could be like, this is a water bottle. This is a mundane thing. It's a proposition. Okay? So in philosophy, beliefs can be very mundane. But Islam is not just a proposition. It's not just a belief. Islam is a form of knowing that transforms this, transforms this, and how you relate with yourself and others, your state of being, how you relate with the world. That's a totally different thing. So Islam is a form, not just a mundane belief, it's a form of knowing that changes this, this, and how you relate with the world. Because beliefs in a mundane sense, they're no good predictors for your behavior, right? This is known in cognitive science. Your beliefs are not very good predictors for your behavior. But the way you relate to the world is probably a good predictor of, you know, your future actions, yeah? So Islam is almost a state of being, not just a state of doing, but a state of being, which is fundamentally totally different. Because abstract knowledge doesn't lead to change. I mean, give me three good foods, people. Vegetables. Fruits and grains, okay? Those are three good foods. Many of you in this audience were having saturated fats, high sugar cooking, a blueberry muffin that could give you a heart attack, right? So this guy knows, Muhammad knows what good food is. Fruits, vegetables, grains. But his abstract mundane beliefs about good food doesn't lead to his change. There is a gap between his knowing and his being. Why is that gap there? And Islam tries to close that gap by making you understand that Islam is not just a mundane belief, but it's a form of knowing that transforms your heart, what you say, and how you relate to the world. And that can only be done by experiencing Islam, not just by having it in here in an abstract way. As Imam Malik said, may Allah have mercy on him, one of the famous scholars of Islam, he said, Knowledge, ilm in Islam, is not just abstract memorization, it's the light that God puts in your heart. So, um, to answer your question about why I became Muslim, <laughs> yeah. it was a bit of the intellectual stuff, and it was a bit of the, the experiential stuff. And for me now, it's probably more the experiential stuff. Because look, you know, we have this crazy online world now, proving Islam to be true, I really believe it's true intellectually as well, but the whole idea of proof is very, very dangerous as well, because what do you mean by proof? I mean, you know, I'm studying philosophy on a postgrad level now, I did my masters, I'm continuing my studies, and we had to do these advanced research papers, for example, on moral realism. You have a really good powerful argument, like, wow, she's so clever. And then the next week, you read the rebuttal. You're like, oh, but she's really clever too, right? He just tweaked your premises slightly. Wow, gee, and it just humbled me. It just made me realize, you know, there is, there is a limit to rationality in many ways, you know. If you study the philosophy of science, there's a thing called epistemic holism. Just check it out. Basically, if you're clever enough, you could show that this universe is a pancake if you play around with your auxiliary assumptions. And intellectually, you might get away with it. It's a crude example, but the point is, you can always, you can even revive falsified beliefs by changing the assumption. The point is there is a level of rationality where it's going to take you, right? And there is a level, and you know, there's arguments for everything. But Islam treats the human being as a human being, not some kind of computerized functional model. It's not you to put an algorithm in and then you're going to act in a certain way. Because the human being has a ruh, has a soul, has a qalb, has a heart, has an aql, has an intellect, has a fitrah, has an innate disposition. Has, has a psychology and you have to treat the human being as the human being and that's why when you talk about Islam don't talk about it in a very abstract philosophical way 
the irony, yeah? Don't, you don't do that all the time because there's a lot of things that are fundamentally experiential. Look, you know, even when you do with the atheist, our atheist brothers and sisters, you think they need an intellectual argument? Let's be a bit more intellectually mature, for God's sake, yeah? All these crazy, stupid YouTube videos I've been watching, someone reads one book on philosophy and they think they could start preaching and they know the answers. This is rubbish. You know, Lao Tzu, I think that's what his name is. Apologies if I pronounced it wrong. He said, those who know, don't speak. Those who don't know, speak. And you know what? That's so true, yeah, in many of the cases these days. Because human beings, we, as Muslims, we need to be more intellectually, spiritually mature. For example, say you give a very good, powerful argument for God's existence, the design argument, a new form of the design argument. And the contention from the atheist is, but it could be a chart still that God doesn't exist. Then you talk to them about the difference between mathematical probability and epistemic probability, and you talk about all this rubbish that no one understands anyway, even you <laughs> and them, right? So the point is, you're talking about these things, but then he still responds, and you still get this on YouTube sometimes, but there's still a chance. Now tell me, for God's sake, let's be intellectually, spiritually mature. Do you think this person needs another intellectual answer? That person has a psychosocial problem. <laughs> but it's true, because for life, for everything in their life, the epistemic bar, the criteria for knowledge, is here. For marriage, for business, for education, for research, for work, for the profession, for kids, for everything in their life, the level of knowledge is here. But for God, and only God, is all the way there. Why the inconsistency? Why? You think they need another intellectual argument? Because there's something psychosocial going on. Maybe they need you to buy them a friggin' pizza. <laughs> but it's true. But it's true. And so many Muslims who think, oh yeah, hey, give them an intellectual argument. Man, be intellectually mature, spiritually mature. I had an atheist come up to me. He was a Muslim, then became an atheist. He did quantum physics at university, Pakistani guy. Then he says to me, oh Hamza, yeah, you know, you know, your argument, your argument doesn't work because outside of the universe, Kozai doesn't exist because there's no time, and for causality you need time, that kind of thing he was saying to me. And I said to him, hold on a second, I, 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 get, I knew the answer. He had an empirical notion of causality. I could have showed him that causality is metaphysical, it's a for all right. But I didn't go into that, I just said to him, what do you mean by causality? Which one of the definitions that even the philosophers haven't agreed on are you going to use? Then he could have given an answer. I said, isn't it very interesting that you, a key word that you're using in a sentence to refute God, you don't know the meaning for? So we sat down, and then he told me, you know what? I didn't really connect with my spirituality, I didn't know how to connect with God kind of thing. His issue was fundamentally different. Another time, another atheist says to me, oh, good debate with Krauss, but I'm still an atheist. Oh, thank you, bro. How's your parents? And he sat down and he told me that he had a negative experience with his Muslim parents. You think everyone needs an intellectual answer? You think everyone's a robot? Let's be a little bit mature. You think you have to give everyone an answer? The one who thinks they have an answer to everything is an absolute idiot. Even God doesn't give you all the answers. He gives you questions. <laughs> to teach you how to think. Allah says in the Quran, chapter 52, verse 35 to 36, did you come from nothing? Did you create yourself? Did you create the heavens and the earth? You have no certainty. Where's the answer? But he's giving you questions. Because if you ask the right questions, it will to lead to the right answers if you're sincere. So the point is, we need to become more intellectual, spiritually mature to help awaken the truth within people and that might not just be using rational arguments. It has a limit, it might be. But it could be just the experiential stuff. It could be the prayer. It could be that you are just a decent human being and they haven't found a decent human being in a long time. It could be many, many different things. Um, so, I think we need to go, we need to become more mature because I see us with this reinventing the same mistakes, right, in terms of how to approach the issue of articulating Islam in the public space. Uh, and, and, you know, it's dangerous, and we've made Islam into this kind of uh, ethno-religious cult, that Islam now is just like a, a cultish identity. And this is very, very dangerous, you know, that, you know, we just consider someone being a practicing Muslim by having identity markers. Don't get me wrong, there's, there's ways we need to behave in the, pub, in the public. I agree. But you can't reduce Islam to an ethno-religious cult. Islam is totally different from that, right? And this is very, very, very dangerous because many of us, especially if we're brought up in a Muslim family, we're brought up in that fashion. We don't know the why, we just know the how. How to pray, how to do ablution.
But why do you pray? Why does Allah deserve worship? When was the last time, you know, you could write two paragraphs on why Allah deserves worship? When was the last time you heard a talk on that topic? Very rare. Yeah? But that's the fundamental point of our existence, right? Why does God deserve love? To be known, to be obeyed, right? Why does He deserve gratitude? These things are fundamental. It, it resonates in the Quranic discourse. That's the main message of Islam, that human beings are in a state of worship, it's either misdirected worship or directed worship to the one that deserves worship, which is Allah. This is in chapter 39, verse 29, when Allah says, consider the state of two people. One man is a servant to many masters and they're all arguing and quarreling. Another man, he's a servant to one master. Whose condition is best? It's as if God is trying to say to us, if you don't worship the one who deserves worship, which is the divine, you're worshipping something else anyway. Because there's always a point in your life that you're going to love something the most, you're going to know something the most, you're going to obey something the most, and you're going to direct acts of worship to something the most, like gratitude. It might not be God, it might be a celebrity, it might be an ideology, it might be your own self, your ego. As Allah says in the Quran, having not seen the one who takes his desires as his own Lord. So the point is that everyone's in a state of worship, because you're always going to love something the most at one point, always going to know something the most at one point, you're always going to obey or be or submit to or to refer to an authority to something the most at one point, and you're always going to express gratitude ultimately to something at one point, and the decision is either God who deserves that or something other than God. So the point is we're all in a state of worship anyway, right? And Islam came to solve the problem. Allah is the one who deserves worship. And you know, we need to articulate that in our public space, which we rarely do. We talk about these abstract arguments as if, you know, that's gonna solve the problem. Hi, can you run <laughs> No, I don't deny it. I don't deny it. <laughs> well, I guess you. Alright, very nice. Sorry, long answer, but hopefully there's something there. Thank you very much for listening, guys.